let's get started with part one of this full stack series. We're going to be starting with setting up the API side of things in ASP.NET Core. As you can see, I have Visual Studio 2019 installed. You can download the Community Edition. It works fine with what we're going to be doing. And we're just going to verify first that you have the actual right installations. So I'm going to go to Visual Studio Installer. We're going to open this and I'm just going to show you what I have installed or what you need to have installed. And what you're going to need to check off is just two things. You're going to need to have ASP.NET uh, web development. And the other one you're going to need is .NET cross-platform development. So make sure you check those, click install, and go through the process, let it load, and then come back to Visual Studio when you're ready with that. And just in case you guys are using Visual Studio code, you could go to this link here, which I'll put in the description below. To download the SDK, make sure you're downloading the SDK for development purposes. Um, you'll download it and then you'll have access to the .NET CLI and then you can do it everything you see in Visual Studio Code as well. And also, I'm going to put this in the description below. That is actually a link to the Microsoft documentation, which will include a whole bunch of examples that you can kind of look through to see if you want to actually practice more about ASP.NET. Or if you're using an older version of Visual Studio, things might look a little bit different. I believe the previous versions were in the top left. You click File, New, and then you will kind of have the same navigation. So we're going to create a new project. I'm going to look for ASP.NET Core. I know it's on the screen, but just so you guys can see. So we look for ASP.NET Core, and we're going to look for the C Sharp version. So make sure you find that one, click Next. And I'm going to be just giving this a name. So what we're going to be making is the recipe book uh, application. And there's two things you'll want to do is to name your project and name your solution. So the solution is the overall namespace, and the project name is what you want to actually call the ASP.NET web application. I like to name them separately just so that the serve libraries that you make afterwards will have the name space and not necessarily the API itself. So click create, then this little dialogue will pop up and you'll be given a bunch of options here. And you can start from MMNT, API, web application, MVC, or you can use one of their templates to actually create a spa app. I'm going to be choosing the API one. And I'm actually going to not check enable Docker support just so that I can show you guys how to do it later. But if you click this, it'll actually create a Docker file within your project. So I'm going to click create and just give this a moment to kind of set up. So now that we have everything set up, I'm just going to be going over the basics of ASP.NET Core and just .NET development in general and kind of discuss what some of these files actually mean. I'm just going to start off by explaining the fundamentals of Visual Studio itself. So on the top right here, you can see that there's a little play button. This will actually be how you execute your ASP application. And there's a, like a little button right here you can see, and there's going to be a bunch of different profiles here. Uh, the two main profiles we'll be concerned with is the IX Express one, which will be default when you start up the application. And this one right here, which will run Kestrel for you. So we're going to dive into that a little bit more of that later, but for now, just know that that's there. And then here you'll have your little profile. So you have a debug and you'll have a release that will matter more once you kind of dig into your configurations and bundling your files. So we'll just leave that for now. And then over here, you can kind of see the solution that we've actually made earlier. Remember, we gave it the name without the dot API. So that's why that's important is because everything under here We'll have that same namespace. And the other thing is the project itself that we made. And you'll notice that the project itself is bolded. Um, when you make other library files, you're going to start seeing that they're actually not bolded. And that's important because this play button will actually trigger for the bolded one only. And if your project is not set up to be the start time, uh, the startup, you can click this and click set as startup project and it will bold that. And of course, if you want uh, many APIs to run simultaneously. Let's say you have your UI here as well. You can actually click uh, multiple startup projects and just click this to start. But we're just going to leave that for now. Let's actually dive into the project itself now. So what we have here is a couple of different things. So connected services, if you just click right here, you can see that you can add things like Azure Active Directory, Application Insights. So those are like Azure offerings that you can actually add to your, your project. I think you can add SOAP services here as well. I'm also just going to close this real quick. Um, next, you have your dependencies. So your dependencies are going to be any uh, Microsoft DLLs or any kind of NuGet packages you want to install here. They will all be listed. Listed. NuGet now is listed under a separate little area. So that's kind of nice rather than being kind of consolidated into one place. Let's just close that. 
And then next you have your properties for your actual project here. Uh, so if you kind of click this, they will actually open your properties here. So you can see the assembly name, the .NET Core version. Um, you can see your profile, your debugging stuff here. And we'll kind of configure that a little bit later. Um, you can also see that there is a JSON file underneath here. And this is actually just a JSON file of the profiles listed here. So you can see those two names that we saw earlier. So from here, I'm going to actually show you the program.cs file. If you take a look at this and you are familiar with console applications, you can see that the static void main here is actually the one that will run when you click the play button. So if you attach a debugger here, you click play, this will be the first thing that runs. And what this does here is it creates a host builder. So it will actually create your ASP.NET Core application and does a build and then it will try to run it. And there's one key thing you want to see here is that this configuration is actually from the startup. So web builder use startup and this startup is actually just located right here. They've kind of separated out the thing that runs the application from the configurations that the application actually runs, which is kind of a nice little separation. Let's then take a look into the startup file itself. So if a startup file is split up usually into three sections. So you have your constructor here where you can use dependency injection to pass in any of the parameters that uh, could be used by the configure services or configure. And what the configure services does is that you actually can register a bunch of your dependencies. So you can register all of the types. So let's say, for example, we're going to install a NuGet package. That NuGet package before you need to be used within your application needs to be registered here for dependency injection to actually be accessible throughout your application lifecycle. And if you haven't heard or used dependency injection in ASP.NET Core, I'll link in the description below of my actual video where I've explained how this actually works. Next, let's talk about the configure. So there's a little key difference. Let me just zoom in so you can kind of see. The key difference between the configure services and configure is the use word. So this convention is actually very important to um, keep in mind is because the configure services is going to just add a bunch of services that you could use, but the configure area is actually going to utilize those services if those services are required by the HTTP request uh, pipeline. It's not going to be too important to know this when you are just first getting started, but I'll kind of just explain the key differences just very quickly about the when to use configure and when to use configure services only. So to get started thinking about this, you kind of need to think about what services you are going to be registering. So a typical scenario would be to use a third party API. And let's say that you want to gain access to some location information. You would then use Google's geolocation API to actually call that API. But in certain scenarios, uh, API developers who have written an SDK around that API would have actually written some documentation to say, oh, add blah, blah, blah here, and then use blah, blah, blah here. Another common scenario is utilizing the repositories. So let's say you want to access a database, you need access. So you would then pass around your repository. And those don't necessarily need to gain access in the request lifecycle. They are a part of it, but they don't necessarily need to modify it in some way. So you can kind of think of it being sandwiched in between the request lifecycle. So at the beginning of a request, you would have ASP.NET do some stuff with its framework magic. And the key part that you are concerned about initially is this right here, is that middle part where it hands off the request and gives you things to do. So here you would typically, let's say, do some business logic. You would call your third party API, you would call your repository. And as soon as you're done with that, you want to then pass back that information to ASP.NET so that they can then pass back to the user. So then ASP.NET would do some kind of response. It would create like your JSON objects to then pass to the user. And all of that's nicely handled for you so that you don't really have to be too concerned about it. And the part you want to think about is this right here this and this. If you are modifying anything between these little areas, you would probably need to do some kind of setup and do some kind of configuration. But typically, if you're just starting out, you won't really need to and you'll just be working within this area here. You'll just be working within your kind of like business domain. And of course, in this course, near the end of this, I will actually show you how to add a middleware so that you can kind of modify this lifecycle. Next, let's talk about the application settings and the configurations that you can actually pass into your system. If you don't know what a configuration file is, it is just a static file that you can pass values into your system so that they are able to be swapped out on, um, on runtime. 
let's say you would have a connection string here or some kind of API key here. And if you are familiar with the on a framework version of doing it, it is usually in a XML file. So it would have been in appsettings.config or webconfig. And I like this way of doing it now because it kind of splits out the way that it was before, because previously you would have had system.web, you would have a bunch of things. Now this is just isolated to just be what you need for your configurations. So let's say you wanted to add something here, you would go API key, and then you would typically just add fake key like that. And now this is accessible within your system. If you would just need to inject in a I configuration and then you would gain access to the fake key. So I'll show you how to do that in a little bit. The next thing to notice is that you actually have environment specific configurations. So in this case, they've produced a development one for you. And by default, if you have not set up your system variables, it will actually just use development by default. So if you want to actually override your API key, let's say we want to just swap out these values. Let's say it's not one, two, three, it's three, two, one. During local development, it will actually produce this key instead of the parent one. So if you have a production one, UAT one, it'll actually override it depending on your environment. And let's talk about what uh, Microsoft has actually scaffolded for us. So let's just close these just so we can kind of keep it clean. Take a look inside the controller folder. So you'll notice that it has scaffolded weather forecast controller and the weather forecast class for you. So let's first take a look at the controller. And what the controller is, is the part where the ASP.NET Core lifecycle has handed off the request to you. So this is where you would kind of be writing your code in. I'll dive more deeply into actually how to set up a controller in my future videos. But for now, let's just take a look at what they've done for us. So they set up a weather forecast controller, which means that this route here will be weather forecast. And what they've done is stubbed out a bunch of data for you. And then they've done dependency injection to actually pass in the logger. And they've created a random set of, um, I guess, weather patterns and then pass it back to the user. So this is also stubbed out here, which is right here. So this is the data model that they want to pass back. And by default, when you return an object back to the ASP.NET Core lifecycle, it will serialize it as JSON format for you. Let's actually run the application. I'm going to first add a debugger right here. And then we're going to start the application on IS profile. And it should kick up a browser for you. And it's hit the breakpoint. So what it's going to do is it's going to generate a random set of numbers. And then it's going to create five, um, five sets of data. And then the random number is going to set up a random set of temperatures. And it's going to choose a random summary. So let's click that. And then we'll see the data set here. So we see five data sets. We'll see the random temperatures. We'll see the random summaries. I'm going to just stop the application here. And it will automatically stop the debugger. The next thing we'll want to do is to switch from IS Express to using Kestrel. And what Kestrel is, is a interoperable runtime. So that means it can run on both Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. So just to do that, you just click this drop down list here and click recipebook.api. Now that we've actually selected that, let's go into our properties to see what it actually is doing. If you see here in the recipebook.api profile, the launcher is actually set for project. That means that it is using Kestrel. So let's just quickly go back to see the difference with IS Express. Launcher is set for IS Express. So the next thing you want to notice is the uh, launch browser. So this will actually open up the browser. If you don't want it to open up a browser by default, you can actually check this off. And then closing the browsers obviously won't stop your server. But let's keep that on for now. And then you can set the route that you want to actually have. So I'm going to be deleting the weather forecast eventually. So I will probably be changing this to some kind of empty or some kind of like health check. But for now, let's just leave it as weather forecast. And next, you can see the default uh, environment variable I actually set for you. So if you want to change this to staging or UAT or anything, you can do so here. And then the final thing is the ports that are actually specified. So here you can see the SSL port and you can see the non-SSL port. So if 5001 is used by another application, you can obviously specify it to be anything else in this um, range. So let's run this now. And you'll notice that a terminal will open up. So Let's go back to that terminal first. So this terminal will basically just tell you the port, um, the, the SSL, non-SSL, how you can shut it down. If you have any logging information, it will actually start printing out and displaying the log information on here, as long as you have the console log set up. 
just like before, you can see that the debugger hit and you can just press continue to kind of let the request go through. So all the capabilities of IS Express, you have that as well in Kestrel. So it returned a data set and I'm just going to close this to stop the debugger. And really quickly, I just want to show you guys the terminal to actually run Kestrel as well. So if you go here, you open the file explorer and then you want to press shift to right click to open a PowerShell terminal or a command terminal. What you want to do is you want to write .NET to make sure, and then press enter to make sure you actually have the CLI working. Type .NET watch run and it's going to kick off the terminal. And this is exactly what you saw earlier when you actually just ran it from the solution. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually change this from one to three and then it's actually going to display and restart the actual server. So let's try that. I'm going to change this three and then just go back and you can kind of see it exiting and then starting again. So if you're using Visual Studio Code or using something else and you want to actually just have a listening and hot module reload, you can also do that as well. So finally, before we end this tutorial, I just wanted to actually show you guys how to use the configuration, just quickly create a request. I'll go more in depth into detail later as we do the controller one, but just so you guys can kind of see how to, the workflow would work. So here I'm going to do dependency injection and add in a configuration. So I configuration and you want to resolve the namespace. So press control dot and then add that using statement. Right now you want to press space and then it's going to suggest a name to you automatically. So I'm going to use that suggested name. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to press control dot again and then go down to create an initialized field. And what this will do is create a private read only and then I don't have to type any of this out. Now that it's injected the configuration, we can actually use configuration to get our app settings. Down here, I'm going to create a new endpoint that says get API key. And then what you want to do is you want to just quickly decorate it with the web method. So HTTP get, and then I'm going to specify the route. So it's going to be API key. And then inside of this, we're just going to be returning the API key. So we're going to use the configuration that we injected in. And we're going to tell the configuration when you want to get the value of the key. And then we're going to return a type of string because the configuration is a string. And then we're going to now name the key that we want to pass in. So let's go back here and we named it API key. Now remember the value will be overwritten in this uh, development configuration because we have our environment variables set for development. So let's close this and let's add the API key here. And now when we run the application, it'll kick off everything like it did before. Let's remove this debugger here and let's run the application. Okay, now we go API key and there you go. We have now returned the API key. And I think that's where we are going to end it for today, guys. The next video in this series will actually be showing you how to add Docker to the system. So Docker will allow us to run this in a Linux environment, and it will also enable us to add SQL Server and add Kibana and add basically anything else you want really, really easily. So as always, guys, make sure you subscribe to the channel, like this video, and leave in the comments below how the pacing of this whole tutorial was. I typically talk really fast. And also I use a lot of hotkeys, so I forget that a lot of people don't know the hotkeys or don't use hotkeys as much and or even have the same extensions as I do to be able to use the hotkeys. So make sure you guys let me know if you start seeing some magic things happening on the screen that you don't know what is going on. And I'll see you guys next time.